Linda to your seat, Linda to your seat. <laughs> I don't see that. It's good to welcome you to Cool Spring this morning. Hope you had a wonderful, wonderful week as we begin our time of worship this morning. Listen to the writings from the 72nd chapter of the book of Psalms. And the psalmist writes, May his name endure forever. May it continue as long as the sun. Then all the nations will be blessed through him, and they will call him blessed. But praise be to his glorious name forever. And may the whole earth be filled with his glory. Amen and amen. Blessed be the name. We're going to invite you to stand and sing with us. The words on the screen behind me. Or you may turn to hymn number 206 if you'd like to read the notes this morning. But let's lift our voices in joyful song today. Would you stand as we sing? <laughs> COVID can cancel a lot of things, but it can't cancel worth and value and love for people.
Well, we are very excited to be one of two churches in the Richmond area that are hosting Night to Shine, uh, an event that is happening all over the world. Uh, and it's going to happen here on February 10th. And so we have an amazing night set up for our guests. Uh, we're expecting around 200 of our friends with disabilities to be on campus. And we're going to have all kinds of opportunities from red carpets to karaoke to a dinner uh, to uh, caricature artists and limo rides. And we just have a, a special night planned for our friends. Uh, and we're really looking forward to it. And we need volunteers. We need, we need plenty of help in all kinds of areas, behind the scenes, leading up to it. We need buddies for our guests, and so if you volunteer to be a buddy, there's some training we have for you, and we'll pair you up with the right guest for you, and you can walk through the night with that guest and experience all that they experience. Uh, it's going to be a great time, and at the end, we have an amazing opportunity to let our guests know you are loved and valued by God and by us. And so I just want to encourage you, uh, if you are able, to go ahead and volunteer for this. And, and you can do that by texting SHINE to our text number. Uh, you can also just email us, wendywshaw at coolspring.org, wshaw at coolspring.org. You can go on our website and find a way to uh, connect there. But if you text SHINE to that number, uh, you're going to get a link. And you click on that link, it's going to explain all about Night to Shine in RVA and uh, as well as uh, have the volunteer registration. We need all volunteers to register, uh, and when you do that, we will follow up with further information. So would you uh, pray for that event, and would you consider volunteering to help make Night to Shine possible? Thank you so much. <coughs> We do truly pray in advance to look forward to a wonderful night to be able to host these individuals here on our campus this year, and it will be exciting. You may not always walk through the Welcome Center in the lower part of the building, but uh, for the last few weeks prior to Christmas, we are collecting prom dresses to be able to even dress them as they come. They get to pick out their own dress, ladies, and uh, to be able to, to shine that night truly and their garments, and so if you still have prom, dress, prom dresses, they can still bring them, can they not? And we'll collect them, and they can choose from those that are that have been turned in. So there's many ways you can share and be a part of that exciting, exciting night. Well, to God be the glory for the exciting things he's doing here on our campus at Cool Spring, to what he's doing in our individual hearts this year. And so as we sing together today, would you mind standing one more time, and let's just sing and give God the glory and the praise for this beautiful day he's given us to the church.
this morning in the book of John, in the third chapter. It tells the story where Jesus is speaking to Nicodemus. And Jesus says, Very truly I tell you that no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. How can someone be born when they are so old, Nicodemus asked. Surely they cannot enter a second time into the mother's womb to be born. And Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you that no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, You must be born again. For the wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. How can this be? Nicodemus asked. You are Israel's teacher, Jesus said. And you do not understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know and we testify to what we have seen. But still, people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things, and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. For God. God so loved the world that he gave his only, his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. May God bless the reading of his word. Yeah. 
beautiful chorus. And I don't think you need the words for it this morning. Would you just sing it from your heart today? Jill going out the door, I just want to move the piano back in the center. <laughs> That's just pure evil, isn't it? <laughs> oh, goodness. Would you stand with me for a word of prayer? Father, um, uh, we are captivated by your grace and your love today, and we stand in awe of you. Lord, that you would make a way for us that you would redeem us, forgive us, and give us life, hope, joy, peace, to abide with you. I thank you for the Spirit's presence today, not only in this room, but in each of us. Father, we call on him today to teach, instruct, interpret, Lord, I realize that as people come into this space, we all have things that we're carrying in, burdens, things that we're bearing. For the burdens, thank you for the people that care, for the loads, for the people that help. recognizing it's all for your glory. When I continue to pray for health <clears throat> for our community, especially in, in light of, of respiratory illnesses with COVID, the flu, RSV, and other undefined viruses and colds going around, we pray for health for people. Well, thank you for hearing our prayer today. Thank you for loving us. For it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. I remember this conversation that happened years ago as if it were just recently. I remember as a, <clears throat> as a young pastor sitting in the living room of a lady who had just lost her husband. And we were talking, she was conversing. We were talking about stories and arrangements and those things that you do. But then she, she paused and she looked me in the eye and she says, Brad, I... I don't know how people do it. I don't know how people go through this that don't know Christ or aren't connected with some Christian people in church. I don't know how I don't know how they do it. 
And as fresh as that conversation is still today, I have heard it over and over and over again over the past years. But every time I hear it, I'm drawn back to that living room in Tampa, Florida. I don't know how people do it either. You see, the reality is, is that stuff happens in life. There is loss. We know what it's like to lose someone, whether it is a parent, a, a spouse, a, a sibling, a good friend, a, a child. We know what it is to be disappointed. We know what it is to have a dream. And, and we have all these plans made and they just evaporate in front of us. And the dreams I think of so oftentimes are the dreams that parents have for their children that never get lived out. Now, somehow you're living vicariously through your child and you shouldn't do that. But, but the second part is, is that you do have healthy dreams for them. And sometimes your child becomes a prodigal. Sometimes your spouse or your parent or sibling is a prodigal. But then there's a time where someone loses their job, employment, income, foreclosure, death, insolvency. Those, those seasons of loss, the seasons, <clears throat> those seasons of despair. You, you may not have had a season yet, but let me just bless you this morning to tell you you will. And here's the important message. You need to be prepared for that season. You need to be ready for that season. In two ways that you need to be ready. One is that you, you need a deep and vibrant reservoir of faith born out of the abiding relationship with the Father. You need that. You need it. But you also need a couple of people in your life, and this is the, the flesh and bone kind of thing, that you need Christian people in your life that are, are part of, of groups, are part of life, are part of church, are part of, part of faith. You, you need them in your life in order to walk with you in those, in those seasons. But you need to prepare now. Because if you don't prepare, when that season comes, you will find yourself empty and alone. God never called you to be empty, but he called you to be full in his abiding. God never called you to be alone. But he called you to be in a relationship with other believers. And it's, it's vibrantly important <clears throat> that we understand that. 23, for me, is the year of formation. We're pouring everything that we can into forming and growing and maturing into giving tools and instruction. That this would be a year of formation in order that you would have a lifetime of transformation. So over the next 50 weeks, we're invested in forming for his glory in you. And this conversation today is, is one that often doesn't get discussed but it is one that is important because we all experience seasons of disappointment, loss, grief. 
And we need to be ready for that. We need to be prepared. And maybe the way to illustrate it is waking up at, at 4.30 in the morning. My alarm on Sundays goes off at 4.30. Rolling out of bed, smile on my face and a jump in my step, not quite, but we're getting there. But I quietly make it out to the kitchen because there's nothing more that I love at 4.32 in the morning than a cup of hot coffee. So I reach in the pantry behind me to pull out a pod for the coffee maker. We filled it the night before with water. That's one less step in the morning, you know. And then I reach into the cabinet above the coffee maker and I pull out a particular coffee cup. Now, this coffee cup is 25 years old. I'm not going to talk about the coffee cup today. It has significance and it's for a conversation down the road with you. There's a reason why I'm using that particular cup more often than not in this season of life. And so I pull the cup of cup, place it there under the Keurig, put the pod in, hit the start button, and, and I'm listening for the coffee. Now, while that's going on, I reach back in the cabinet and I get my two sugar packets out of the serving dish open them up, pouring them in, because it's important that the sugar is going in while the coffee is going in as well, the cup. But then I've got to grab the creamer. So I move over to the refrigerator, open up the door, and on the top rack is where we keep the container of creamer. It's a nice box. It's even better when there's creamer in the box. <laughs> I go to pick up the creamer to only discover it's empty. Now it's 4.35 and my morning is destroyed. <laughs> not, not really. <laughs> but my plans are now changed. The reason I tell you that story is it's a humorous way of looking at reaching for things that we need them at certain points in life and finding them empty is a disappointment. I never want for you to be empty. I want for you to be full. I never want for you to be alone. I want you to be connected. And part of the scriptural basis for the conversation is out of a couple of passages in scripture today uh, that I want to read to you. Uh, a couple of them are just like really fantastic in a sense of, of their, their application for, uh, for us. But I want to read to you in Paul's letter to the church at Colossae, the Colossians, um, chapter 1. I'm going to back into verse 9. I think I have something a little bit longer there. Yeah, verse 3. So I'm going to go down to verse 9. Not that verse 3 and 8 are great, but I'm starting in verse 9. Um, Paul says, And so, from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you would be filled with the knowledge of his will. The word knowledge in the Greek is an interesting word. It actually has this idea of determination. So you could translate this as that I am asking God that you would be filled with the determination of his will. It's one thing to know his will, it's another to be determined to do it. But that you would know the determination of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, that you would gain wisdom and understanding from him in order to live in determination his will. So as to walk 
in a manner, to walk around in a manner that is worthy or compatible of the Lord, fully pleasing to him. And that as you're walking, that you're bearing fruit and good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. May you be strengthened with all power according to its glorious might. For now think about this. His strength, his might. For all endurance and patience with joy. Do you realize that joy is experienced through endurance and patience? It's the hard joy, but it's the deep joy. Giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption for the forgiveness of sins. What I love about this introduction, Paul, is that he wants the people to know that he is praying for them. He's praying about the determination of of God's will in their life and be determined in living it out, walking in a manner conducive, compatible with the ways of Jesus. And not in their own strength, but in the strength of the Lord, that they would live out of that strength. This idea is that he is praying for them and that there is joy on the other side of perseverance, on the other side of patience, on the other side of endurance, there is joy to be known that he is our deliverer. See, there is a reason for the abiding. There's a reason for the deep reservoir. There's a reason for the, the relationships and the intimacy with others. But let me share with you another passage. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 through 7, and, and there again, I'm probably going to read a couple more in this, but he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, that's compassion, that particular word is used five times in the New Testament, it's unique and it's compassion, and the God of all comfort who comforts us in all of our affliction. The idea is, is, is he encourages us verbally and non-verbally. He comforts us in all our affliction so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction. Interesting that he specifies specific affliction that you may suffer, but you're walking through that particular affliction and the comfort that you you receive, that you're able to comfort anyone in any affliction. The idea is that God's comfort is universal. Pain is relative. Anguish is relative. But God's comfort is universal. Regardless of the affliction, you can give comfort with the comfort that which we ourselves are comforted by God. Verse 5, for as we share abundantly in Christ's suffering, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. If we, have a, if we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. And if we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which you experience. Now listen to this. Which you experience when you patiently endure the same sufferings that we suffer. Our hope for you is unshaken. For we know that as you share in our sufferings, you will also share in our comfort. We don't want you to be unaware, brothers, of the affliction we experienced in Asia, for we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt that we received a sense of death. But that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. He delivered us from such a deadly peril, and he will deliver us. On him we have set our hope. 
that he will deliver us again. You also must help us by prayer so that many will give thanks on our behalf for the blessing granted us through the prayers of many. This passage is phenomenal in the fact that it speaks to the comfort and compassion that God has for us. And he extends to us this comfort and this comfort that we experience in our afflictions in these seasons that we're able to comfort someone else and, and share that same comfort that we know. But then again, there's this beautiful picture of the prayer that is taking place. Paul recognizes the importance of being prayed for. He recognizes the significance of praying for others. There again, this deep reservoir of faith and this connection with other people of faith as well, and how important that is. Romans 5.3, I'm not going to read it, but um, what you find is hope is the product of perseverance. This hope and this joy, let me, let me share this. What I've discovered in in our current culture is that people are too quick to give up. They're not residing in a deep reservoir of faith and they're not connected to people and so they are empty and alone and they're more prone to give up. And you know what happens? When you give up and you do not persevere, you do not walk with steadfastness, there is not a sense of, of patience and endurance. You miss the hope and the joy that God has for you. But you've got to walk through the valley first. Don't give up walk. And it's not just a joy and a hope at the destination. There is peculiar hope and joy that God gives along the journey. It's the reminder of the abiding. It's a reminder of the deep reservoir. It's a reminder of the relationships that are in your life. So it's important to, to recognize that. Um, John 14, uh, another passage, John 14, verse 15. Jesus says, if you love me, you will, you will keep my commandments. The idea is that you will continue in them. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. Even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. Now, the idea of seeing is to observe the idea of knowing is to become acquainted with. But he says, you know him. You are acquainted with him. For he dwells, he resides and remains with you and will be in you. I, verse 18, ah, good stuff. I will not leave you as orphans. I will not send you away fatherless and alone. Did you hear that? That's why the abiding, that's why the deep reservoir is so important. I will not leave you as orphans. I will not send you away fatherless or alone. I will come to you. Ah! can't tell, I'm just kind of excited about that part. The incarnation, what we did over Christmas celebrating the coming of the Christ child is God coming to us. He took the first step. He came to us. Think about the imagery in Luke of, of the prodigal son that comes home to the dad. And as the dad sees the son in the distance, what does the dad do? He runs to his son. It's not about the son coming to the dad. It's about the dad going to the son. What a beautiful picture. I will come to you. 
You are not alone. This deep reservoir of faith. Yet in a little while, the world will see me no more, but you will see me because I live. You also will live. In that day, you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. This deep, abiding reservoir. One last passage, just as, as a note of example, I think of Jesus with Lazarus, and Lazarus has died, and Mary runs out to see Jesus in, in John 11, just a few pages to your left, verse 32. It says, now when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. And when Jesus saw her, her weeping, and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in the spirit, greatly troubled. And he said to her, where have you laid him? And they said to him, Lord, come and see. And Jesus, Jesus wept, and the Jews that were with them said how, how he loved I think that's such an incredible picture culturally. A people of faith gathered at moments where people need people and the tenderness and compassion, the, the empathy, the sympathy, the presence, but how people make a difference in people's lives. People of faith. I keep going back to sweet, sweet lady in Tampa. Brad, I just don't, I don't know how people that don't have Jesus do this. Don't have the church background. People of faith. I couldn't do it. I don't know how they do it. This I know. You need a deep reservoir, and you need people in your life. And so, as a pastor, and, and I say that from the sense that as a pastor, as your pastor, as, as your friend, when we're talking about forming and growing, I don't want you to find yourself in a place where you're empty and alone and you're bitter and you're angry. I want you to be in a place where you are full and you're abiding and connected with others. People that know Christ, people that speak truth into your life. And so what I want to, I want to strong, I can't say this enough, I want to strongly encourage you. If I could go tell you what to do, like I tell my two and a half year old grandson what to do. And he does just like everybody else does. No, you know, just, just, like, well, just like church. No, you know, but, uh, but seriously, this is what I tell you to do. I want you to work on or cultivate two or three faith relationships this year. And I want you to hear what I'm saying. I want you to, I want you to cultivate two or three faith relationships this year. I want you to make room for the coffee, for the conversation, for the disclosure, for the encouragement, for the loss, for the struggle, for the wins. These are the people that will walk with you. They need to be people of faith. They need to be Christians, Christ followers. They need to love Jesus. See, we all have friends that don't know Christ. And if you're getting advice from them, all you're getting are well wishes. But when you're getting poured into by people that know and walk with Christ, that are growing and flourishing in faith, you get God's word spoken into you because you know they're in the word, you know they're listening to God and having the opportunity to speak into your life. To express the comfort and compassion that Paul talks about. You need those relationships. And so cultivate those. Work on it. Invite for lunch, dinner, talk. Share the struggles and the wins together. And it doesn't happen overnight. It's over a period of time. It deepens. 
Second thing is, is to be present in faith communities. And when I say being faith, present in faith communities, that's kind of an all-encompassing term to say <clears throat> everyone in this room needs to be in a class or a group of some kind here at Cool Spring. Everyone. No excuses. No options out. No, no, well, I don't know. You need to be in a group, period. No buts, period. No excuses, period. It is in those groups that you get to know people. It's in that group that you get to tell your story. It's in those groups that you get to hear other stories. It's in those groups that you get to share out of the reservoir. It's in those groups you get to share out of the abiding. It's in those groups that you get to share the struggles and challenges and you hear the stories. You need to be in a group. And you also, you also need to gather when the church gathers. There's something about being in the presence of people. And I realize that we're living on this side of the pandemic and everyone's talking about the new variant. I mean, we're going to have a variant the rest of our lives. We just have to be smart. But here's the thing. Connection is important. You've got to be known and you have to know others. Because the comfort that you've received is the comfort that you're to give. The affliction that you walk through is an affliction that you share with others. All about strengthening the people of faith together. But being connected and being in group and being present. And for example, there's, there's a different, there's a little phrase, right, that's called apart. I can use that two ways in a sentence. I want you to be a part of a group, I want you to be a part of a group. Depending on where I put the space between the A and the B means something completely different. If I want you to be a space part of a group, it means I want you to be engaged in the group. If I were to say that I want you to be a part, a no space, P-A-R-T, it means I want you to be separate from a group. We need to define what it means to be a part. It means that you're present, not your name on a list and show up twice a year. That doesn't do anybody any good. It means you're present 52, 100 times a year. It means you're doing life outside of the meeting. It means you know people, and they know you. You are a part of a group. You are a part of the church. Which leads me to number three. We have to take responsibility, our responsibility, for reaching out and receiving. Here's what I know about that. I don't know anybody that knows how to read minds. Now, I thought my mother did at one age, one time. But, but really, nobody can read minds. I have no clue what's going on with you unless you tell me what's going on with you. And so I think you have to create a culture where we realize that none of us read each other's minds and we've got to share things. The other is, don't expect certain things if you haven't communicated those things. Uncommunicated expectations always create havoc. If you've got a need or expectation, communicate it. And don't assume people know. You've got to share. And I realize, I, I, I mean, in, in, in the world of church, we have people that, that, I mean, I know we have all the HIPAA and privacy stuff. I get that. But, but we have people that are just, just really private. I don't tell anybody. <sighs> Come on. And you expect me to know, but you don't tell nobody, you know? That's not good English, but they have nobody. But you don't know, tell anybody. Listen, people want to know because people want to care, and people can't care unless people know. And you don't assume somebody knows. That's the beautiful part. And Glenn, are we not right? Here at church, I think Glenn and I are the last two people to know anything at Cool Spring. <laughs> Truly. Because you told somebody in your class three months ago that you might be doing this procedure, you somehow expect it's gotten all the way to Glenn. Glenn has no clue. 
Same thing with everybody else. You gotta talk to people. You gotta tell them. Share. So there's a responsibility that we share for, for, for engaging and connecting and being a part, not assuming. One other thing that I, I'm gonna get off that soapbox and move on. We need to listen, to read, to learn, to reflect, to remember, and apply. We need to live out an established routine of inspiration. Don't expect what you get in a class or here on Sunday morning to be your only intake for food. You need to know how to feed yourself. You need to have your own routine of, of inspiration and, and growth. And, and that's part of the Bible study tool that we're talking about, the Bible reading tool for next week, and Brian will be sharing that with us. But the whole idea is how do we read slowly? How do we read reflectively? How do we read to hear? This idea of reflection and record and applying. But I think we also have to choose to be an acquaintance of his, and not an acquaintance as being somebody that doesn't, know him or participate or engage with him, but somebody that is in a deep and, and abiding relationship. See, I wish you joy and hope, but I know that joy and hope often come through the struggle and the valley. You can know them in the hard places, which means that you have to persevere. You have to persevere. You have to live steadfastly. You have to walk with endurance, not in your own strength, but in the strength that, as God's word says, that he provides. I don't want you to be empty. And I don't want you to be alone. Now, God created you to be full in the abiding with him out of the deep reservoir. God created you for relationship and connection with others. You need both of those to weather the storm. The reality is it's coming. <clears throat> you may have a storm-free and difficult-free 23. You may have a perfect year. Chances are you won't. Something is going to happen. Don't be empty. Don't be alone. Don't reach for that creamer and find it empty. You need it when you need it. But you won't have it if you haven't already got it. It comes on the front end. To allow you to walk to the back end. Full, connected, and abiding for his glory. The stories that God is writing are incredible. The stories of the faithfulness are phenomenal. They come from Greek reservoirs, and they come from abiding in relationship. Father, Lord, I thank you for the privilege of, of just sharing your word, and expounding upon it, and, and just from the standpoint of the importance of this deep reservoir and the importance of connected to people in meaningful ways, a part of life. Lord, I pray for those in this space today, both that are catching this virtually or those that are in this room. Oh, that we would know this deep reservoir of faith in you. That over time, as you taught, over time as we've learned, over time has been built. And the same goes for the relationships that we share in life as well. Deep, meaningful, Christian faith relationships with other believers. Father, we recognize life is to be lived for your glory. My desire 
for my life and for the life of every individual in this room is it would speak to your glory. May we be faithful in the good times. And may we be faithful in the seasons that are tough. Because of you. We love you. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. I'm going to invite you to stand with me. Glenn's standing. You can stand. You can all stand. See, you don't stand until he gives you the hands, right? It's like, here, please stand. Please stand. <laughs> You know, that was it. Anyhow, um, <clears throat> I want to encourage you in the strongest way. You know, when I think about opportunity to connect, um, you may be a guest at Cool Spring. Maybe you've never taken a step to join or get in a group or whatever. Man, make the day the day you do that. If God's calling you, may you come. If God's calling you to baptism, that next step of obedience, we're baptizing on the 22nd here. Uh, at least four, uh, a couple more as well, potentially. But uh, we have a great group to be baptized. Maybe it's time for you. You've never been scripturally baptized, and it's time to be. Maybe that's the way you're starting out 23 in obedience and, and following in the method and the mode in which Jesus was baptized. The most important thing is about the decision uh, that you've made to follow Christ. You cannot be full unless you first turn to Jesus and you surrendered your life, you've repented, you've turned to him. And you're following Christ. That's where the filling begins. And you need to know him in order to develop the deep reservoir or for him to develop it in you. And so maybe today is the day that you say yes to Jesus. I just want you to be prepared. I don't want you to be empty. I don't want you to be alone. I don't want you to get bitter. I don't want you to get angry. But I want you to know the strength and the power to walk faithfully through the trials challenges that life presents because it's ultimately the Lord's glory. So you come as God leads. Glenn's going to lead us.
Brian is going to be teaching on the Bible reading tool. It's the introduction. The trainings are, are throughout January and into February as well. So have multiple times to train on the tool itself. Pretty easy to do, but uh, excited about that. On the 22nd, we do have baptism, but we're also starting a series that are really five statements of Jesus. And these are five statements that speak directly to formation. But the one we're talking about on the 22nd is about the hardness of heart. And what I find fascinating about the hardness of heart, maybe maybe sad, not fascinating, sorry, fascinating is not the right word, is that our hearts can be hardened and we don't even realize it. And so how do we gauge the hardness of our heart, the softness of our heart, and what are the things, I mean, what is, what is the hardness of heart? And in a sense, what is the Greek, I mean, what does the word mean? You know, so we're going to pack that, but I, it, it's, it's incredible to know that we can be walking around with a partially or almost entirely hardened heart and yet still be around spiritual and religious people and yet miss God. And so we're going to talk about the heart uh, on, the, on the 22nd. So excited about that. Now, everybody's not going to show up. He's not going to want to talk about it. But anyhow, I just want to <laughs> let you know from that, from that standpoint. But uh, well, let's have a word of prayer and um, we'll go. God, thank you uh, for the privilege of gathering and for the privilege of just sharing your word and opening it up and talking and reading it. And, and Lord, it's application what it looks like for us. Well, my heart, as you know, is that um, we would not be empty and alone, but we would be full and connected. And so that I pray that for each of my friends in this room today. Lord, reveal this next step for them. The contacts of the people, the connection of the groups, the, the reading and applying and reflection of your word as you speak, all for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Have a great, great day.